So my name is Lucy Jelma. I'm the Educational Development Equity CSEE. Uh, I'm wearing a black dress and a Indigenous pattern flowy thing to make me not just be wearing black. Uh, and my two co-presenters are sitting over here. If you guys would like to quickly come up and introduce yourselves. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Melanie White, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Sciences. Thank you so much, Melanie. Hi, I'm Michelle Madigan, and I'm from the School of Optometry and Science. We're both wearing blue and white. We yes. each other. I don't have a mobile phone, so anyway, we're all coordinated. So. I'll pick my turn, my clicker on. For my acknowledgement of country today, uh, I'm doing something a little bit different and pointing out a piece of artwork that's on the UNSW campus. If you haven't been there before, I really encourage uh, going roughly that direction, probably to look at the stairs. They're really, really beautiful um, and really connect with the medical land that we're on today. Okay, our agenda, I'm going to be talking for a bit about inclusion and the different background bits and pieces and benefits. And then Melanie and Michelle are going to give you that really hands-on stuff you can just take and run with um, through their experiences teaching here. Okay, so first up, we are going to do a bit of a warm up uh, where you will need to stand up. For our online participants, I am about to paste something into the chat. Yes, it's worked. Okay, so what I've put in the chat for our online participants, the first link is for profiles. You'll notice that each profile in the folder is numbered. So what you need to do is open the dice roller, which is the third link, and if you roll a six, you open profile six, for example, and then go through the privilege walk link. If there is anything you're not sure about, um, because the profiles aren't extensive, they are just an overview, uh, feel free to either guess or to use your own experiences. Or if you want, you can do the privilege walk with your own experiences either way. Um, for everyone here, you have some little profiles on your tables in the middle there. There's enough for everyone. So feel free to take one. Um, so these are all profiles of people that are either currently studying at UNSW or have successfully completed a degree. Um, so these profiles of real people, but they're just a snapshot. Obviously, you can't um, sort of give an overview of someone's life and a few dot points, um, but it's just an illustrative exercise. Alrighty. What I'm going to need all of you to do is grab your profile and stand up in a line along here for me. Face. I found some geographic inconsistencies in that. <laughs> <laughs> so like that you live in the inner west, but you also it only takes you thirty minutes to walk to UNSW. <laughs> I live in the inner west. Just oh, step forward or back. That's true. Okay, got it. Alrighty. So everyone, try and line up to about here-ish because you're going to need to be able to step forward and back. So. Oh, all yeah. right. Okay. So what's going to happen is I'm going to read a statement, and if it's true, let's not trip over a table. If it's true, you need to take a step forward um, or back. I'll tell you which way you're going. Uh, profile. profile, right? Your profile, not view yourself. I'm not going to expose all of your backgrounds through this activity. So for your profile. All right. Take a step forward if it takes 30 minutes or less to get to UNSW. Take a step back if it takes over an hour. Take a step forward, and sorry if you run into furniture, you just got to work around it. Uh, take a step forward if you entered UNSW without the assistance of a pathway. So if it doesn't mention a pathway, it means you came in without one. Take a step back if you had tutors in high school. Take a step back if you had to move away from family to attend UNSW. <laughs> Take a step forward if you're involved in the UNSW community beyond just attending classes. 
Take a step back if you have additional responsibilities, such as being a carer, working part or full time. Step back for that one. Take a step forward if you're from a mid to high SES neighborhood. If you're not sure, take a guess. Sneak around here. Let's go. Hey, take a step back if you have a disability. And take a step forward if you have someone at home to support you. So while we all start in the same place, we can see we are very much spread out and a little bit squished over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of us accessing university. So all of these things that we went through are things that can in impact a student's ability to participate to access. So for example, the fatigue, students that have to travel over an hour, they're gonna be a lot more tired than the students that live on campus and just walk to class. Um, or if, we have tutors sometimes, not all the time, but some students that come from those high end Sydney schools where they have 50,000 tutors, they don't develop those independent study habits. So depending, it's not always that, you know, you have a disability or from your low SAS background that gives you benefits or um, difficulties, but all of those things impact the way that our students interact with university. All right, you can sit down. I won't make you stand up again. Don't worry. So I was feeling weirdly competitive. Like they online participants, you've been able to have a bit of fun um, with the online privilege walk. For everyone, you'll get that link as well. So if you're interested in that activity, you can do it for yourself. That one's a lot more specific. It's like, are you left or right handed is one of them. Um, but it's actually quite interesting clicking through it. Okay. So where, where are our students coming from? The disability standards for education were put in, were started in 2005. Now, so that means technically the last couple of years of students that we've had have benefited from this. Realistically, it's more likely that our current students are the ones that have benefited the most from this, partly because schools took a while to enact it and to understand it. Um, Frankly, coming from a school background, it really depends on the school and how well they're doing it. But because of these standards, there are students that will come to university that have gone through their entire school life from kindergarten to year 12 with adjustments that have supported them to succeed. So they've achieved their HSC with these adjustments and also achieve their ATAR with these adjustments. And so when they come to us, if they then step into our classrooms and we have no inclusive teaching, we don't have any adjustments, those students are not going to perform at the level that they're actually capable of because they, because of these standards for education, they've had that support all the way through. And that's a really great thing because something to remember about supporting our students is that when they have these accommodations, it's not making things easier for them. It's about making learning accessible. It's about removing barriers of things that don't actually impact their IQ. The Gateway Equity Target is our big initiative that's going on um, that hopefully everyone's learned about. So it's that we want a quarter of our commencing domestic graduate students to be from a low SES background. So that's students that have attended gateway programs in high school, which you may have heard of before because they've been around for quite some time, or they've come into UNSW through the gateway admission pathway, which is where they have adjusted ATARs. So these students that have entered with an adjusted ATAR, they really need that support um, from us to be to succeed. Now, not everyone that uses that pathway actually needs it. Um, they, a lot of them get the ATAR they require, but then as we sort of saw with that privilege walk, there are different difficulties that come from coming from a low SES background. So it's about providing support for everyone so that anyone that needs it can use it. Now, this is a quick, interesting one 
Um, the Red Arena Teaching Hub is quite new, so I imagine not many people have heard about it, and I will send a link to the website. But basically, this allows students from the Roof Arena area to get their teaching degree at UNSW while staying in the community. So they get to stay in the Riverina, get a teaching degree, and then they get a permanent job in their community. So it's really great because rural and regional schools have a lot of difficulty getting teachers out into those areas. And something that we see with our rural and regional students is that they can find it quite hard moving to Sydney. If you've come from a rural area, come into Sydney, your community's left behind, it's a whole new world. I worked with a high school that was just for rural and remote students, it was all online. And it was amazing to see some of those students, the things you wouldn't expect to surprise them. When they came to Sydney, we had a camp. So one of them was the student asked us, oh, how, how long can I have a shower for? What, what time do I need to get out of the shower? So not like, you know, shower for 10 minutes or what we want, as long as you're available for the next activity. And their eyes popped out of their heads like, oh, my God, I've never had a long, hot shower. There were others that when you went to the city, they kind of, you could see them step back because of how massive the buildings are. And I'm not just talking about year seven students. Some students joined from year 10. So you've got these students that have come from a, almost a completely different world. So the Riverina Teaching Hub is really excellent. And I've talked about it for a bit too long because I'm quite passionate about it. But I highly recommend checking it out. But it means that those students that are a part of that are doing their course completely remotely. So we need to be able to think about the implications of that in terms of teaching inclusively and allowing students to connect remotely. Now, at the moment, it's in its pilot stage. It's quite small, but hopefully it gets picked up and will grow in size. OK. So. Uh, the um, comic on the left says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And we've got a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, a fish, a seal, and a donkey dog looking thing. <laughs> on the other one, it says, cool, I'm in a balloon hat too, which is a little porcupine. Um, and the panda and the... Anteater. Anteater, thank you. Look a bit awkward until they work out a way around it for the cute little porcupine. Now, obviously, these are really cute, and the, the differences are very clear. What what the barrier is to the situation? So, when we think about inclusive teaching, it's a lot easier to work around situations like this, where we can see the obvious difficulty. If someone has a broken arm, you're not going to make them do a written exam because that's unfair. Just like that, they're not going to put a balloon on the porcupine that's immediately going to pop. But when we have barriers that are not as easy to see, when we think about invisible disabilities, when we think about caring responsibilities, when we think about other things that come into the context of considering our students and their backgrounds, that is a lot harder for us to be able to cater for because we can't see it. Or it might be that you can't relate to it. If you're neurodivergent, you probably do some things that support neurodivergent learners because you know it from your own experience. But if you've never, if you are not, if you're neurotypical, it's harder to think what those students might need without that extra training. So you can see here that there are strategies that support lots of different groups all at the one time. When we first think of subtitles, generally people think, oh, people with hearing difficulties, they need subtitles. But there's actually a big group and lots of people that benefit from subtitles. And these aren't even all the examples. And some people just prefer to read rather than hear. And that's just a preference. That's not even anything to do with a disability or anything like that. So, but something to remember with all of these, when we think about, oh, but then there's so much stuff to cater for and there's so many things we need to do for these people. You need to remember that inclusive teaching is something that we always work towards. It's an ever-evolving discipline. You're never going to be able to say, yes, I'm perfect in inclusive teaching. At the same time, you shouldn't beat yourself up if you're not doing everything all at once. 
you're human. And so as long as you care about your students and you, you want to learn more, then that's what's important. So then try a new strategy once a term, once every couple of weeks, whatever works for you and what your current mental load is. Okay, Because I know it's so common for us to get burnt out and to get focused on, oh, we've got this exam or I've got to do this marketing, I've got to do that. Like if you don't have the mental capacity to try something new, then just give yourself a bit of time and then come and try again. Or do one thing and try it for a month and then reflect and go, how has that actually supported my students? Has that worked well? Having that reflection and being able to adjust is really important. So one concern that some people sometimes have with inclusive teaching is that it's spoon feeding and they confuse it with spoon feeding. So it's not about making things easier. It's about making them accessible. So all students still need to know the content of your class. They still need to be able to apply it in their career and future, in their degree and their future careers. But what inclusive teaching does is it removes barriers to that student's learning. So their a student's circumstances, background or disability don't impact their intelligence, but they create barriers that make it harder to succeed. So they might still pass their classes, but they may be getting a lower grade than what they're actually capable of. Or for some of our first year students, those difficulties might just seem like it's too much work and they drop out. And we obviously want to avoid that. So now I promise on this slide, we're going to have a break to talk so you can have a break from my incessant chatter. Now, uncon unconscious bias is a mixture of stereotypes, perceptions, and associations that we all hold and we're often unaware of. So when working with a range of different students, developing our inclusive teaching pedagogy, it's something we need to keep in mind. But we can't control or eliminate these biases, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we want to, but we can identify which parts of our decision-making are likely to be impacted by negative biases and put measures in place to interrupt or to block them. Because I know sometimes we'll say to ourselves, no, I know that I don't have these negative biases. I know that I am a good person. It's, it's human nature. It's not about being a good or a bad person. It's the way that our brain is, it's, it's the way our brain works, is that we have these unconscious biases. So something that's happened a lot in businesses across the past couple of years is that they have unconscious bias training and it's aimed to eliminate their unconscious bias. So it doesn't work. All the research that goes into it is that these businesses have spent, you know, this ridiculous amount of money on this bias training that doesn't actually work. The thing that works is looking at our systems and processes and go, okay, where is my unconscious bias going to become a problem and how can I change the way I'm doing things so that it doesn't actually impact the students? So that's what we're going to have a little chat about. It's so going to give you five, five minutes, yeah, five minutes, about how you can address your unconscious bias in your role. So if it's a lecture, a tutorial, a workshop, if you're divisional staff, what are some ways, if you're creating resources for students or what, whatever your role is, consider what can you do to get to try and minimise the impact of your unconscious bias. Online participants, I'm going to chuck you into breakout rooms so you can discuss without hearing us. Everyone else, off you go. Have a nice chat. Um, so hopefully you all shared some interesting ideas, um, ways that you're currently doing it or ways that you're thinking you could in the future. Um, something that is very common that a lot of you are familiar with and might have brought up is, um, is marking assignments anonymously. So where well, we don't have the student's name, which I think is pretty general practice, but that's a great example of removing that unconscious bias and it works both ways it's not always negative like if you like a student you're going to be a lot nicer about the marking and you're going to be a bit more generous and it might be that generally you like them but last week they're a bit of a jerk and so then this assignment they're you know so having that anonymity is a really great way 
to address that. So I just want to say, feel free to put it in the chat for our online participants, because um, I am monitoring that on my phone. Uh, but for anyone, online or physical, what was uh, what was a strategy that someone shared that you thought was a good idea or something that you also do? Um, just to share a few ideas of how we address our systems and processes. Did you have anything? We were talking about retaking a lot of the stuff from the online era that kind of allowed for participation without the kind of, I guess, the stereotype of being there live doing it, like people who are perhaps more anxious or choose to engage in a different way that's not just raise hand and say stuff. Beautiful. So like the use of polls and things in, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Does anyone have any others? Scary. I'm not going to get you in trouble. <laughs> That's okay. I won't force you. Look at me being inclusive, not forcing <laughs> anyone to do anything. Oh, great. We got one in the chat. Um, spoke about how actually knowing your students can help counter biases. So, knowing your students is one of the key, to me, the absolute most important thing that we can do when we talk about inclusive teaching. Knowing your students makes a huge difference in terms of helping that student to feel belong, to feel that they belong, that they're part of a community. And then it starts to build that feeling of safety. And once they feel safe, then they're more willing to make mistakes and to ask questions. So I've kind of failed because I don't, I'm not making you feel safe right now because people don't want to share things, but that's okay because I only have an hour. So, <laughs> but it's a really, really good point. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. I want to elaborate on that a little bit because we were talking about that too, where I think for, for at least three of us, it seems like the reasons why we're here are very similar is addressing this question in a way, like how do we address unconscious bias um, if we're like not aware of it or if it's, if you know, I think this exercise is just really hard because like how can we share what our best practices are when we're not really know, like, you don't know whether it's working or not because you, you, you know, don't know all the profiles of the students. But one of the things that we talked about there as well, like knowing your students is none of us here are average students, right? We're, we're all teaching a subject that we excelled in um, or to some extent, right? Where we're either really interested or really, I see someone shaking their head, so I'm going to a little bit. Um, but we're, we're not the student in the class that doesn't understand. And that's something that I struggle with why I came to the workshop is like, if I was in my classroom, explaining a concept that's incredibly intuitive to me, I can't even access the point where I, where a student wouldn't understand it. So I, I don't know how to explain it in a way that makes sense to them because I don't know what it's like to not understand the thing I'm trying to explain. Um, and I, that's something that I was looking for strategies. So I don't really know how we can share best practices on that because they, I don't know if you can experience that again where you, know, you don't understand how it works. That's an amazing point. So. One of the things with unconscious biases is you can learn to acknowledge them. So, um, and over time, and it's a long process, trying to work out what your unconscious biases are. Um, like, for example, my mum is, you know, she's almost 70, um, so I'm, and she grew up on the northern beaches and has always had a very, you know, and um, so same with my uncle. And so my partner's Samoan. And when my uncle met him for the first time, he was like, oh, there's some really friendly Samoans that I work with. And it was like, what? why do you need, you don't even need to talk about his background. Just talk to him like a regular person. But that background is that he did it, he doesn't, he's like the head of a company. And so the Samoan people he knows are his factory workers. So he's sort of seen this divide and that's an unconscious bias because he thinks, oh, it's great. I'm telling him that they're nice people, but really like I can see from everyone shaking their heads, it's not a great way to interact with someone. So, or like my mom, she is not great with like Western Sydney and anyone from a Muslim background. I worked next door to um, when I was teaching. My next door teacher was um, is is Muslim and so beautiful, so lovely. I would come, I would get home all the time as well. I still lived at home so a while ago. Um, say, oh, like telling stories about her. And then when Mum met her, the first thing she said to me was, "I didn't realize she was Muslim." 
It's like, oh, because it doesn't come into it, does it? I just talked about what a great person she is. So those are really obvious ones. And hopefully none of us have those big glaring, like, oh, old white person that grew up in a very sheltered environment sort of things. Um, but hopefully over time you can start to learn some of your own and you can see the way that you interact with certain situations um, and have that reflection. It's the same. So if we get time at the end, I'll try to address the other part of what you were saying in terms of strategies, um, because I don't want to miss out on Melanie and Michelle's part where they have some really great strategies as well. Okay, so benefits to inclusive teaching. Oh, sorry, I just missed Tara added a great point. So the use of anonymous digital documents in tutorials. So learners that aren't comfortable speaking can contribute to the group discussion. So that's another great one. Thank you, Tara. Okay, so teaching inclusively has a lot of benefits. Some of these, student retention, engagement, and sense of belonging are the biggest ones that we see through research. But I'm going to get, um, maybe we'll get Melanie first and then Michelle to chat about um, the benefits that they've seen through their years of inclusive teaching. Hello, um, definitely these. Um, but to these, I would say, um, I would add maybe a couple of things. First of all, um, greater student investment in the content and um, greater student interest. But significantly, I think it's also the pleasure of success and seeing students actually move through a particular program of study and realize something of their accomplishments that they wouldn't have otherwise. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I mean, these these are certainly top of the list. Um, other things that do relate to this are, are also that students feel safe and comfortable in your class uh, settings, wherever they are, whatever they are. So it means that they're happy to ask questions. So I've, I've had students say, you know, I feel safe in this class. I'm happy to ask questions. It also means that often students grow in interest for the topic. And um, so, you know, slices of tissue and cells are not always everybody's favourite thing, but sometimes students grow in their appreciation of the topic if they feel engaged and they feel part of the, the learning. So I think that's also really important. And, and I echo Melanie's comments on the joy of seeing students progress through the program and sometimes they find that they go in different ways because they realize the program isn't for them that's also actually a really good thing because it means that they're finding their way um well very big and the learning world is a huge so for them to changing direction is actually also something i think is very good about inclusive teaching Sorry, a bit randomly, sorry. No, no, <laughs> All right. So now we're going to switch. So Melanie is going to talk about her um, context and give you some really great strategies to take away. So um, I'll pass over to her. Thank you very much. Um, I think my contributions here today are really um, in part neatly situated in terms of my specific context. Um, I teach in the School of Social Sciences. I teach, um, although I teach into the sociology program, there is quite a wide diversity of students from uh, a range of disciplines, social work predominantly, criminology, etc. cetera. Um, and if we were to ask, I always get a question, what is sociology? I would give this back of envelope really hasty um, uh, description, which is the study of socially structured ways of thinking, acting, and feeling. Now, in my particular context, I tend to teach large classes. I have um, a large lecture of about anywhere, depending on the year, between uh, 350 and 500 students and um, uh, smaller classes at level, uh, level two of about 100 students. Um, and the diverse the diversity of this context is really important. Um, there 
uh, are very often first year students who have never been to university. Some of them are first in family. Um, some are students who have returned from very successful careers um, uh, to study. Others are um, uh, returning after looking after uh, their kids and wanting to do something for themselves. Some of them are international students, some speak English very well. Others may not so well. Um, and I think it's important to always uh, be attentive to the fact that there is diversity, visible or not. Um, when I was thinking about um, how to teach or how to make a presentation about teaching for inclusion, it became really important for me to articulate what principles you are, are teaching for. And for me, um, the number one principle is that every student matters. Rather than teach to an aggregate or to teach to um, a homogenous group, I always like to think that I am teaching to individual students with their own diversity, with their own background, their heritage, their language, their preferences, etc. And that gets me into a bit of a mindset about how to be open and accommodating to difference when it presents itself and when I haven't been prepared for it because there is a degree of individuality. And I think I'm responding to the question that was a really good question posed earlier is preparing yourself for, uh, for diversity. The other thing is that depending <laughs> on the context, um, there are many factors um, that influence a student's sense of whether or not they are they, they are included, but rather than force a certain kind of you must, <laughs> you must participate in order for you to be included, <laughs> actually giving students options, giving them choice about what best represents their learning style, their particular approach. Maybe they need extra time in terms of being able to think through a question on the spot, but then returning back to that student and asking them, oh, um, did you have some time? Did you want to contribute now? Um, the other thing is that student feedback, where I think um, teaching staff are often jaded in or <laughs> by my experience uh, reports, but they are so valuable as a source of information in terms of how students are receiving the, um, the, the course content, but also about the classroom teaching environment in terms of creating space for making making mistakes, space for um, invitation to participate, and a space for openness in terms of raising questions, etc. So I just wanted to say for the, to that point that the feedback that you get matters. And it's in that sense of how do you respond to that feedback, um, because each cohort of student will, will perhaps be different. One of the uh, commitments that I have is a commitment to the free expression of diverse thoughts, perspectives, and experiences. And again, that comes back to that sense of teaching to individual students as opposed to an aggregate or a particular uh, population. And lastly, an acknowledgement that I'm learning. My tutors are learning. Everybody is learning about how to engage with one another in fruitful, productive, thoughtful and inclusive ways. And sometimes it's about encouraging students to or inviting them to give you feedback that may be uncomfortable, it may be challenging, but to create space for students to come forward and say, oh, I didn't understand that concept. Can you can you repeat it? Uh, can you repeat it again? Can you repeat it again? Maybe you'd like to come to my office hour after after lecture, etc. Um, concrete techniques. 
One is to model respectful engagement and dialogue in oral and written communication. That's really, I think, important in terms of maintaining a vibe in terms of how um, students engage with one another and with uh, members of the teaching staff. Um, and it's also in terms of, of valuing um, student contributions in classroom. And um, here it's uh, rather than saying, oh, yes, oh, good, oh, good, even if a student hasn't has said something quite uh, um, either incorrect, it's that gentle sort of correction and uh, refocusing and reshaping that actually creates the conditions for, for in inclusion. Um, I create uh, communities of engagement and interest through Moodle forums. Um, here's course content. What, um, you know, do you have anything that you found in the week that might relate to or be similar to or might spark interest in? Um, most recently, um, I've had a couple of students ask some really curly questions in my lecture, and I almost fell prey to, oh, that's so interesting, let's discuss it. But then realizing that in this particular context, it was becoming an individual discussion as opposed to a broad, broad group discussion. So I invited both students to actually post their question to the course forum. They did, and we were able to pull in. Um, I was able to respond and pull in other students' remarks as, as a consequence of this exchange. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge the impact of local impediments, train delays, floods. Um, I recall um, uh, last year and the year before, the year before there were the floods, last year there were the train delays, and students would be arriving a hot mess in lecture or I would get hot mess emails. And I think that there is something so important about saying, I know uh, this is uh, so distressing. This is so difficult. I get it. Don't worry about it. And that eases the um, sense of expectation of the student and facilitates um, their engagement with the classroom. And I think a lot of it is about being open, being open to making a mistake yourself, being open to um, uh, people articulating views or perspectives or challenges that uh, you might need to take on board. But I think ultimately it's about even in a context where you know, we are all time poor, we need to make judgments about where we're going to put our time and our effort into. And one of the things for me I've discovered is the value of investing in students and their experience and um, accordingly to follow up and refer where necessary. Um, concrete strategies. Um, one of the things that I have begun doing is including a statement of inclusion on Moodle. Um, this is the example of the one that I use. It is a signal to students right from the start that um, there is a space for them to claim themselves and to articulate their preferences in terms of their pronouns, their name, but also a signal that, um, that it is okay to uh, to come forward and be, be acknowledged. Um, with respect to equitable learning services, um, the, the, I guess it's not new anymore, but the um, ELS platform is, is very administratively uh, useful, but it isn't necessarily so welcoming or thoughtful for students. And I think that we receive the prompts and we click, 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 yes, acknowledge, but really there's um, something so useful um, for in reaching out to a student in advance, copying their tutor in, saying, hello, welcome to the class. Here is, um, you know, here, this is your tutor. 
uh, you know, this is uh, prior to the class even commencing. If you have any issues, reach out. Please don't hesitate. I mean it. <laughs> and then that actually sets the tone for engagement and assessment. For particular um, uh, visual impairments, for instance, or neurodiversity, one of the things that I do is in my classes, we have uh, uh, written texts, the, um, and so I convert the PDFs of assigned readings to Microsoft Word. So what that does is that facilitates the modification of text. So if a student is visually impaired, um, and I don't like that word, I, in any event, um, they can increase the font so that they can actually uh, uh, see it. Um, they can space it accordingly. And this also facilitates um, text to speech voice generation time. Uh, no, you just have oh. a question from the chat. Oh. Um, so, Diana asks <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you using PLD, personalized learning designer, in supporting you with the email you're sending out? Um, the answer is no, but I'd love to find out more yeah. about PLD. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Please send me an email. <laughs> I would love to know more. <laughs> it may help. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, um, I also um, uh, make uh, little videos, and these are just videos on the fly of um, and they're video podcasts with really low production values. Um, even me walking home from school, from the bus stop, et cetera, um, of the assignment. So what is it that I'm looking for? Um, what are some pitfalls that students run into? What are am I expecting? What are the marking criteria? This I don't do when I'm walking from the bus, but um, I tend to, uh, and it's about a 15 minute um, video and I upload it and students can then view, slow down, increase the speed of my voice, and um, it allows them to pause, digest, replay, to enhance their confidence in approaching the assessment task. And it gives them a bit of a personal relationship with me, even though I'm just on the screen, um, they will get a sense of, of what I am. Mean. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Hearing impairment or neurodiversity. Um, I make transcripts of lectures available to students via Lecture Recordings Plus and facilitate closed and open captions where appropriate. And I give students multiple ways to provide input, paper in class. What was one thing that you liked about today's lecture? Is there something I can be doing differently? Um, little polls. Um, et cetera, just get jazz There we go. And you'll have to excuse me. Um, um, this is life in the fact lane. We'll have to put it out. But thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Melanie. She has to run to another lecture. So um, <laughs> now Michelle is going to share some of her strategies with us. Thank you so much, Melanie. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. So um, I'm from optometry and vision science, and um, I teach students in stage two and three, so they're a little bit more through the program. Um, I, I teach fairly fact-driven things, so anatomy, diseases, uh, ageing, development, things like that. So um, my classes, though, are usually for lectures, about 110, and I like to do small group tutorials. In fact, I love small group tutorials most of all. Uh, and I, I try to do them all in person, and I usually try to do all my own teaching, which is also an interesting thing to do. Um, one thing, though, that I, I do think is, um, when I'm doing online classes, is I always try to start with saying hello, because it's good to make people feel welcome. And I'll tell you a little bit about the whiteboard, but after a little time, you can see that the students like to interact just before we start. And I get some lovely things uh, with drawings and so on. So 
Um, techniques, and th these can be big picture sort of techniques. These apply to me in my office, finding first year students out in the corridor. And I always pop out if they look lost and I say hello and I ask them where they're, where they're going and if I can help them. So this is big picture sort of stuff. Um, I always, it's also very good to try and make sure people know each other's names if possible, especially in small group tutorials. Um, and the mindful of students near your area relates to my office being in this corridor where lots of first year classes happen. So uh, it's sort of nice to be able to help them if, if they're wandering past. Um, another tactic that I think does help a lot is I, I when I first started teaching, I was late for everything and I, I'm on a very steep learning curve. I've been teaching for 15 years now. I came from a lab. So I'm, I'm like a lab person that ended up in a teaching environment and I'm still on this curve. But um, I do now try to get there a bit earlier. And I, it's nice sometimes just to have a little chat with the students if you have time. So I'm not saying you have to do this, but if you have time, you know, you get to know them. You, you can ask them what the last class was, if they're getting ready for exams. It, it just makes the mood a little bit more comfortable. So. Um, Another thing too with the equitable learning students, and I, I echo Melanie's comments, um, once we work out who the students are, we usually in the classes we have, we contact the students individually um, and then let them know that we've got their plans. And then before each assessment, we also make sure that we contact them and say, look, we've, we've included your adjustments, just be you know, assured that everything is okay for your assessment that's coming up. So it, it's just to make people feel that you know, everything is okay. They don't have to get stressed about at least that part. Um, before, um, as I said, online whiteboards, the whiteboards are your friends. So so I, I do encourage this. And one thing I've noticed is that over time, if, you, if you're in week one, you might not get much, you might just get a little smiley face and a hello, but by week 10, you get all sorts of fantastic drawings and stories. And um, I guess growing up in the country, I'm a bit of a storyteller and um, and I talk really slowly. That's another problem that I've had. Students sometimes say I talk too slowly, but anyway, that's, that's how it is. But the whiteboard is really your friend. And um, I also good to do a little sound check. Um, Students often don't want to switch on cameras and videos, but having the opportunity to annotate is actually really great for including everybody. So um, we do that. And um, during class, I let them draw all over everything because everything I do is actually very visual, which I was thinking about it afterwards. It probably sounds terrible for people with visual impairment, for example, but a key thing with your slides is to always have the old text to describe what the image is. I also try to include good descriptions. Um, high resolution images so that they can be zoomed up and down is also very important. Even colouring is important for people who might have a, a colour disability. Uh, I'm not very good at that, but I do ask my colour vision colleagues over in the school, what are the best colours to put together? So I, I've made awful mistakes in that area. Um, but during class, uh, I, I like people to put things on slides, um, to ask questions on slides. Uh, we often do pointing to things, little questions. Um, if there are words that are not commonly used, so a lot of anatomical words, I, I try to put little definitions at the bottom, that give a sense of where the word comes from because it makes it more interesting. Um, so uh, a lot of engaging with the material as we go. So this is mostly for online classes. Um, and then also anonymous comments, because I know that sometimes it's terrifying having to talk out in the middle of a class. Um, in terms of during the class and at the end, we often have lots of breaks. So I, I try to put breaks in between things. Um, I do lot another, it's probably a bit corny, but when I go traveling, I usually take photos of things that I think might fit into my teaching. And so, um, you know, people doing exercise, it does look an awful lot like neurons doing that. So um, I, I do try to kind of personalize that a little bit so that people can have a little bit of a talking point. And we do rests, we have regular breaks. 
Um, during breaks, if we're in class, sometimes I'll just go around and have a little chat to people. Um, you know, it's to try and make everyone feel comfortable and welcome because sometimes it's terrifying when students come to class. I think they feel very anxious. Um, and at the end, I always say thank you for the joining of the class and also ask them if they'd like to add any comments or um, include things in Moodle. So on Moodle, we have Q&A forums. We have anonymous places where they can ask questions. Uh, often they just email. I gather the emails and pop them into the Q&A so that we can all discuss. So our students are not so good at Q&A forums, but if you gather the material, you can pop it in all together on the Moodle and then go from there. Um, in person, uh, a lot of talking, a lot of hellos and chats and stories. Um, and I do find sometimes the students don't know each other. So even just the first thing is just to make sure everyone knows who's in their class. Um, questions also very important. Drawing, uh, I, I like drawing. I'm not a good drawer. It's not art. It's just communicating. Um, sometimes we have snacks as well. So at the end, um, often if I have two tutorials with a space, I will usually stay in the room. And it's, I've found that students sometimes want to talk to me about all sorts of things. Career pathways is a favourite for vision science students. So it's one of the things that I think makes them feel welcome and included. Um, we also have very um, good updates on our classes. So, you know, I give a weekly update online. Um, I also make sure that what the outcomes and expectations are. We do have very good um, assessment calendars in optometry and vision science. So you can plan your assessments so they're not all on the one day, for example. So if the students let me know ahead of time that something's clashing, I, I will happily move things around. It doesn't pull me to do that. Um, and so we do have updates very regularly throughout the course. Um, the other great thing that we have in our school is we have year reps. And so the year rep can be your great friend as a teacher and to help things be inclusive. You can ask them regularly, how's the school, you know, how's the student cohort going? Are there any complaints? How can we help everybody? And so regular meeting with our year reps is a very good thing. I, I found... I've been doing this more often. And that's it for me. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Now I'm going to speed through this last bit. <laughs> um, so you'll be set these slides, so you'll see these key tips. Um, you can do a reflection in your own time. We have upcoming workshops, um, but what I'm going to leave it on is feedback because that's what we really need. <laughs> um, oh, the subtitle said you're in time instead of your own time. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have time, it is super, super short. Um, we really rely on our feedback to make sure we keep improving these presentations. Um, I apologise that we are at time here, but if anyone wants to stay and talk a bit more about um, that, uh, that question that we had earlier, feel free to stay. Um, but you'll get a follow-up email with a link to the survey, the slides, um, and information about other things that we've talked about here. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Um, and feel free to stay and chat to each other or ask me any questions. Um, and, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Thank you.